right, welcome to so to the Jake Blanchard podcast. Really excited for today's guest, Aaron Gollop. Uh, welcome to the show, my man. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Looking forward to being here and, and chatting it with up with you, dude. I am. Uh, I've spent some time uh, researching you, getting to try to know you, understand you a little bit. Um, you have a very interesting story and uh, I want to get into that first off though, before we get into it, uh, we had some scheduling ups and downs. I always like to talk about this cause this is like the, the back end of the podcast, right? You know, this, this is the stuff that happens behind the scenes that people don't get to see, but I had you, this is, this is a, this was a first for me. So I had you scheduled, was it two weeks ago? I. Uh, yeah, probably two or three weeks ago. It's two yeah. or three weeks ago. And uh, I had it on my calendar and I had it all prepared. I'm ready to rock and roll. And I didn't send you, I didn't send you the calendar invite. <laughs> so then I get on Instagram uh, and I hit you up with a direct message and I'm like, Hey, uh, aren't we podcasting today? And in, in my mind, I'm, a, I'm a, like a little smug. I'm like, what's this, what's this guy doing? He's standing me up on a podcast. And then, uh, no, it was a hundred percent. It was a hundred percent. I was my, like, and, and my, my response was like, yeah, I thought that you, uh, you, you weren't doing it. I didn't get an email. <laughs> then, and then I opened up, I opened up the invite and I saw that your email wasn't on. I'm like, God, I'm such an asshole. Uh, <laughs> so it was, you know, it was uh, fun things that happen when you're scheduling, but again, thank you for being gracious enough to, to, to join me on the show today and uh, course, I'm owning course. it, uh, in the spirit of owning it. My yeah, no worries. Uh, but again, honored to have you on the show. It's best, I think, if you give a little bit of your background and your history. So yeah. you're you're very familiar uh, talking about and obviously living it. Um, so like, let's wh where's the most uh, the logical place to start with you, Aaron? Yeah. So you know, I'll just give my quick kind of brief overview. But my name's Aaron Golub. Obviously, I'm legally blind, no vision in my right eye, very limited in my left. Played football at Tulane University, becoming the first legally blind Division One athlete to play in a game was named a team captain, went on to become an NFL free agent, and now I'm an entrepreneur and speaker and, you know, uh, really have, uh, you know, my, my, my feet in different areas of business and speaking at companies, events all over, and, you know, excited to be here today and, and share my story and, and, you know, my journey. Yeah, that's, that's awesome, man. I, I know you've talked about some of this at length, but I, I really want to start kind of unpacking maybe the, some of those critical moments in your life yeah. where um, you one decided to be at some point in time, you decided that you wanted to be an athlete and play football. Like, yeah. Yeah. When was that? You know, growing up, I played every sport under the sun, baseball, soccer, lacrosse, hockey, basketball, nothing stuck. Nothing was great. Nothing. I was very good at. I mean, like picture me playing lacrosse and a ball flying at me 80 miles an hour, not being able to see it. Like, of course that wasn't a good sport for me. I just like, come on. <laughs> yeah. Um, Decided in seventh grade I wanted to play football. Always loved, uh, always loved watching it. And you know, I knew at the time I couldn't be a quarterback or receiver, kind of the positions everyone wanted to be. Started as an offense and defensive lineman, and I mean, for lack of a better term, I was terrible. I was undersized, you know, small, not very athletic, not very confident. It was, it, it, it you know, wasn't strong, wasn't fast. Um, basically, rode the bench for the first several years. You know, didn't really play a ton. Was there to you know because I enjoyed the sport. It, you know, helping out my teammates, doing whatever I could to learn, to grow, to get better each and every day. And, you know, in 10th, 10th grade, sophomore year of high school, I really made a decision. I was like, I'm so sick and tired of being like a third string junior varsity player. I'm going to play division one football. And I made a decision right then and there that I was going from sophomore year in high school, third string JV lineman to a division one athlete. And I was going to make it happen no matter what. And I found long snapping. And I said, if I got good enough at this, I might have an opportunity because it's such a niche, niche position. And every single day for the rest of high school, I would get up at 5 a.m., go practice long snapping, go to school, go to practice with my team, lift weights every single evening. And I just realized that if I work 10 times harder than everyone else, then I might have an opportunity. Oh, wow. Wow. And can you explain a, a little bit about, you said you're legally blind. You said you have partial yep. vision in your left eye. Is that correct? Yep. So, or, yeah. So no vision in my right eye and limited in my left. And, and, and ex maybe expand on that, what that limited means. Yeah. So it's, it's, I mean, it's really a small hole, like maybe the size of half of a dime or, or something like that. It's hard to explain kind of the actual circumference of that, but it's, it's a small hole that my vision is probably, you know, 22, 23, 2400, something in that range. So, you know, with someone who has 20, 20 vision through that sees at two or 300 feet away, I would likely see it like 20 or 30. 
Um, but it's also only through a small hole. So it's not like, I don't see through my pupil. They had to make a separate hole on like the side of my eye when I was born. So I could see through that essentially. Wow. So were you born completely blind? Or not really. I, it's, you know, honestly, that part, I probably should ask, you know, my parents more questions about questions about that side of it. But, um, no, I was, I was born and I think they just knew that like, they had to make another hole or something where maybe it was blurry or maybe it like they, they were able to save vision in that eye by doing a procedure and, and, and creating that hole, but they weren't able to save my vision in my right eye. Okay. So then you, you grind, man, you do the thing, you put the work in, right? You don't, you, you understand that the only path for you to get to where you want to go is to just put your head down and drive yeah. and grind. What was it? Take me back to that that period of time like was there was there a lot of self-doubt in there were you just so committed to it that you knew you were going to make it no matter what like what what was I mean, that period of time like most people thought i was an absolute idiot and, and there was a zero percent chance of me making it but i always knew that i was gonna and i vocalized it because i'm i mean i'm a big believer if you have a goal vocalize it say hold yourself accountable have others hold yourself accountable and you know i told people i was gonna do it and i i did it like i, I genuinely didn't care what others opinions were what others judgments were it was, I'm going to get to 5 a.m., go practice every single day. I'm going to go lift weights every single day after school, after practice, to do whatever I could to get there. And then it was, you know, the recruiting process. So I was, by my senior year, you know, I was ranked as one of the top long snappers in the nation, you know, one of the top overall prospects in Massachusetts. But, you know, it doesn't, it, it's different than being like a top quarterback in the nation. You're not getting calls from every single college coach in the country. So I basically did, you know, tons of cold outreach. I contacted every single college coach in the country through email several times until they either didn't respond or didn't, you know, or said, no, I cold called all of them. Also, I, there were a handful of them that just showed up on their campuses and tried to meet with coaches, you know, and I understood that like the same thing that got me the athletic ability to get there was going to get me an offer, opportunity and an offer to play in college. And that's what I did. Yeah. It just showed up or persistent getting after what was it like getting that college offer? How, what, what was that process like with Tulane? Um, you know, it was incredible. I, I had contacted, you know, like I said, every school and, and Tulane basically gave me an opportunity and they were like, look, if you want to come here, um, then, then you can, you can, you can come play. We like your film. We like what you're doing. You know, you're a great athlete. You're a great long snapper. I think there can be a fit for you. So, you know, I, I basically said, okay, you know, I, I can't make the decision without coming down and seeing it. So I basically got on a plane, you know, probably the next weekend, I think, or a week later, um, went down, visited the school, met with the coaches, and, you know, agreed right then and there that I would go. That's, that's awesome, man. I remember watching ESPN. I'm a big college football fan. I'm a Boise State guy. So I my undergrad was at Boise State. You know, I love the Cinderella story of, of what Boise side State. Note, side note on that real quick. I, I have to say, I, I wish I had played a game at Boise State. I've always wanted to play in the blue field and see uh, how that like affected things. I don't know. I'm just curious <laughs> to me. Like, it, yeah. it seems so cool. Like, what, like, I I, I just, it, it's intriguing. I would have loved to play on that field. Yeah. You know, it's, it's fun as a fan. Like, you know, I, I hear, you know, in the mountain West, like we have different folks, I have friends that you know, go to Nevada or go to Fresno or, you know, whatever it is. And they'd always say how much they, you know, the field's a, such a unfair advantage sometimes, especially when we're wearing our home blue on blue on blues and you know, kind of dis you know, people kind of disappear out on the field sometimes. Um, which, you know, I, th I think in, in fairness, um, is true, but it's, it's an amazing stadium. It's an amazing college football culture, uh, here in Boise. I certainly, um, certainly enjoyed it. So I'm plugged in, I'm plugged into the college football thing. I remember being in a bar and what seeing an ESPN clip. And I don't know if it had just happened or if it was something that happened that day or the day before something like that. But I remember they talked about a long snapper who was legally blind who was playing in division one I, I i do remember this i also remember having mixed feelings and i think like a lot of people and i, and I want to talk about this because i was like ah oh, like what is this like is this a gimmick is this a thing i know that i had that feeling i had that thought yeah and i and also I'm know sure a lot of people did and and i watched some of the media coverage afterwards and some of the questions that were posed directly to you rub me the wrong way in preparing for this interview because i went back and watched some of the stuff that was online the questions that folks asked like like I'm as if curious, it was like, like a, what types of questions yeah it was it was it was more like this was kind of like a one and done kind of like well, and, feeling around it I, and i get what you're saying in the sense of like the biggest thing that i wanted people to know is like 
I was by no means a charity case. Like they did not give me an offer and an opportunity to create publicity for, you know, that I worked my ass off. And then when I was there, you know, I'll I'll give you a quick story to kind of explain that. So sophomore year of of college, played for the first time, two months later, coaching staff was fired. We went three and nine my, you know, first two years. So it was time for them to move on. And I was in this position of just uncertainty of doubt of, of not knowing what was happening because I wasn't kidding. I contacted every school in the country. This was the school that gave me an opportunity. Like I was considering quitting. I was considering transferring. Like I, I just was so fearful of the new staff coming in, just not giving me a shot. And the biggest thing that that people need to learn from that is like action beats anxiety in every single thing that you do. 99% of the time you build some circumstance up, some conversation up, some whatever it is up in your head. And you create so much more doubt, so much more uncertainty, so much more anxiety around it because you're just pushing it off. And that's what I did. And so I eventually just said, screw it. I sat down with the head coach. We had a conversation. He was unsure and uncertain as well, just because he had never worked with someone like me. But we basically came to an agreement and we were like, let's do spring practice. Let's see what happens. And, and we'll go from there. We did spring ball. You know, I pushed myself every day on the field in the weight room, in the classroom. We never had that conversation again. I continued to play on the team. And during my senior year, I was named a team captain because I was able to transition his thoughts, his feelings, his opinions and show that not only could I be a good athlete, but I could be a good teammate and I could be an outstanding leader by my examples. That's a beautiful thing, man. And, and, you know, looking you up and, and understanding more about how hard you work and how much of a team player you are and how much of a, like an inspiring individual you are, especially now in this part of your life as well, the way that you go out and you speak and you inspire others and you're a very positive and motivating person. Like, yeah, I'm just, whatever. I, you know, in your mid twenties or however old I was when I was watching ESPN, I didn't give it much thought, but I was like, Oh, I, I, I don't know how to feel about this as an adult in my thirties, like who really is trying to contemplate what it takes um, to be great at things. Yeah. You embody that. You absolutely but I think are. I appreciate that. And I think like most people at the time, you know, unless you were kind of at Tulane or you knew who I was or whatever, you, you probably had the same feelings as you had because you probably were like, oh, did they just do this for, you know, to be nice or, or whatever. And, you know, I don't blame anyone for thinking that, but anyone who knew me knew that was, you know, obviously not the case. And, and I think that the more interviews, the more speeches, the more I've built myself as a brand, the more that's gotten out there versus like the media controlling the narrative yeah oh for sure and so like let's go through that so you get done with your playing career at Tulane team captain you know four years did you do four did you I, I don't played know all four. you played all four and then and then what happens next I mean they, you know I didn't want to give it up I wanted to play in the NFL and so I was training for my pro day flew out to San Diego for part of my spring semester uh, trained with, you know, legendary NFL kicker, John Carney and, you know, a bunch of NFL oh, wow. kickers, punters, long snappers. Um, and, you know, did that for a bit, came back, did my pro day, you know, snapped really well, talked to a bunch of coaches and, you know, it just didn't work out. I talked to some teams and, and, you know, nothing, it didn't go how I wanted, which is totally fine. You know, in the NFL as a long snapper, it's one of the hardest positions to break into. There's 32 teams, 32 long snappers. If you don't get hurt or screw up, you're there for 15 years. And that's amazing for the guys there but it's not like a quarterback where there's three guys on the roster. And, you know, I accepted that. So after that kind of happened, I transitioned, went into the world of finance. That's what I studied, you know, uh, soon after going into the world of finance, you know, realized that, Hey, I also, you know, want to find a way to create another income stream or or something like that. And I was like, Hey, I've, you know, I did a lot of speaking in college and high school through these interviews, through things I could, you know, monetize that. And so it started off with like, how do I build a brand for myself on social media? How do I, you know, go into places and offer to speak for free or speak for $500, you know, things that were, you know, low hanging fruit and it evolved into, you know, now I'm no longer in the finance industry. I speak, I run other businesses. Um, I'm starting other businesses. I have done, you know, eight Ted talks, which, you know, I can go through that if people want Ted talks are thousands of times easier to get than you actually think they are. If you understand how you know processes work and systems work and honestly, just like, intelligence not not to say that but it's like the same as like applying to a job and and we can go through that later but if you you know essentially if you apply to a job and and people always are so amazed that i got eight but like apply to a job you're never going to get it if you're in a stack of a thousand resumes if you find the people running it and you reach out to them 
then you're going to be at the top of the line. But anyways, the point there is then I turned it into how do I monetize this? How do I get paid not 500 bucks, but thousands of dollars to you know go speak? And that took a long time. It took a process, but I was able to build businesses and it's led to other relationships and, and business opportunities because of it. Yeah. And you know, you, you talked about your, I'm going to go all the way back to one of the first things that you said in, in, in your last couple of sentences here is um, you studied finance. You were a pretty good student. You've always been a pretty good student and like, take me, take me what it's like to learn seeing through like a tiny hole. Like, I, like, I don't, I, I don't know, man. I, I, it seems like a hell of a hurdle to get kind of used to. If it's the only thing that you knew, like I, I get it, but like, yeah. what, what, what was it like? What, how do you have to, how do you read? Like, do you yeah. listen or do you read or like, help me? Yeah. You know, I mean, I was a decent student. I wasn't like straight A's by any means, but I was you know, a fairly decent student. And for me, it was, you know, technology was a huge thing. You know, if I couldn't zoom in on my computer or my phone, if I couldn't highlight things and have it read to me on my computer, then like I would have been screwed. You know, if I was growing up 30 years ago, I would have, I would have been so screwed with that. Like, I, I'm sure I would have found a way, but it, it, life would have been so much different and, and, and more challenging when it comes to school. And so that's kind of how I navigated it because of, you know, the technology of, you know, the age today. Oh, very good. Very good. So let's go to the TED Talks. Like I, that was one of the things I wanted to get into uh, as well as you've done, you've done eight of them. What subjects do you talk about? Like what, how, how did you find out that you yeah. wanted to do them? And then, you know, why do you, why do you do so many of them? Yeah. Well, I, I don't do them anymore. Um, okay. I did a couple, probably like two or three in person. And I did probably like five, you know, six or five or six uh, virtual. And the only reason I did it was I set out to say like, Hey, let's get one or two of these on my resume. I thought it, you know, would look good. That was, that was the only reason. Um, I created a process with, with a mentor of mine. Um, you may or may not know him, but his name's Jeff Lopes. Um, and you know, we're, we're very good friends and, and he's a very successful entrepreneur. And essentially we, we came to the idea, like what, like why are people going and filling out these applications for Ted talks? Like it, it's the dumbest thing in the world. It's the same exact thing as if you apply, for example, I was in finance. If you go out of college and you apply to Goldman Sachs, you're in a stack of 5,000 resumes. You are never going to get hired unless you find an alternative way into that company. It just, you're not. And so what we did was we said, okay, how do I find where all these TED Talks are happening? And there's a list of them on their website. If you look, you'll find it. You can find it and you click on each event. You go to it. You find, you know, from that, you can see who the organizer is. Then all you have to do is find their email, find their LinkedIn, find their Instagram, find their Twitter, and just omni-channel outreach. Hit them on five different platforms of, hey, this is who I am. Would love to connect. Saw you're hosting a TED Talk. You know, if you're looking for a speaker, would love to be it. You know, they either didn't respond, which is fine. They respond and say, hey, we'd love to have you. Cool story. Fill out this application. Because I've already connected with them, my application is going right to the top. Or they say, hey, let's hop on a call. We hop on a call. I don't fill an application. They say, yeah, I want you to come speak. And I spoke. And, and like that, it's, it's, it's so much simpler than you think, but it's not easy because most people don't want to do that work to actually get them done, but it's a simple process of finding who runs it and then just doing outreach. Yeah. Very good. And then the topics that you talk on, is it mostly your life story or like, or what else are you yeah. expanding into? You know, when I talk, for example, you know, speeches at companies or, or events, there's really, you know, I always touch on my story and relate it to the talk I'm giving, but four main areas you know number one is achieving goals through adversity that's kind of my you know top keynote the one i do most of the time talking about despite the adversities the challenges the obstacles you face how do you shift your mindset and perspective to overcome them create success accomplish your goals the others are leadership and leadership development uh, diversity equity inclusion and high performance and business growth and then those are really the topics that i mostly talk on when i go to companies or conferences nowadays okay yeah i uh I actually want to dive into that DEI stuff, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Because that, that is, um, you know, a lot of times that we hear things like diversity, equity, inclusion, I think the two categories, at least that come to mind for me, are um, women and mm -hmm. or uh, I would say the... Um, race and gender right yeah race, yeah, it's basically race and gender. You're like the LBGT, so that's how fucking clunky I am. Yeah. Like, I don't... 
I don't I don't know I don't know what to say. I don't know how to describe things. I'm a, I mean, I'm a, I'm a honestly, dumb man like, in Idaho. But yeah, race and gender tend to be the things that we focus on. Yeah. I mean, I I am not a typical like DEI speaker. I don't talk about like it's I'm very different than most people who say, "Hey, I can talk on DEI." It it sort of just happened. It wasn't something that I set out to be like, "Hey, I'm going to speak on this topic." That was not like my topics originally were like overcoming adversity and leadership. You know, that those were my topics. And obviously as, as I got better at business and built businesses, I brought in like high performance and business growth and DEI sort of happened because companies or schools or events would be like, Hey, you have a unique story. You know, you obviously are someone who's, you know, overcome a, a great obstacle, having a disability, you know, I don't know of any good, you know, they just hadn't had a, a phenomenal DEI speaker who wasn't just like a different race or a different gender or, or something. And they were like, could you talk on this? I was like, well, I'll make something. And so I, I created a speech for that. I created topic areas that we talk on that I talk on and, you know, developed it over time. It's not something that like, I'll go into a company and say, here are the percentages and the numbers of, of X, Y, Z and, and why this works. and doesn't, it's like, this is my real life experience. This is what I believe works and, and doesn't work from practical advice and how you can implement them to help to create a better DEI culture. But I'm not going to go in and be like, you should have a, 35 percent higher rate of this like i don't do that it's it's yeah. very different okay and then what what are what don't people or what don't companies understand about folks who are legally blind i think there's there's a few areas it's like how do you find the right candidates to hire you know and, and source them and make sure that they're a good fit for your organization how do you make sure that they they you know gel into the right culture and how do you get them promoted and, and move up the food chain? Because a lot of times people with different disabilities stay stagnant at a company for you know many years. And it's about, hey, you know, what can you do to work with them to fit them into the right role? And it, there could be simple changes. Like, you know, if someone who had who is blind or legally blind might be able to do 95% of a job, but 5% of it you struggle with, well, you could reorganize the team and distribute their 5% across the rest of the members. And maybe they take on a little more work from the task that they're good at that they can do from other people. And just coming up with tactics like that, that honestly are common sense, but most people don't think of. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, I, I love that. I also, you know, candidly, if I had a resume for an individual who is legally blind applying for a position in finance, I can't help but confront my own bias. Yeah. And everyone that has space. that unconscious bias. Like I, I do as well. I have that about people as well. And it's, it's not about, it's, I think 90% of that, uh, of changing that is just understanding that you have it because the second you recognize it, then you can make that mental shift. Like that's, it doesn't matter. We all have it. No one's ever going to get over it. It's just understanding that you have it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. My man. So then you're, I, I, did you talk a little bit about your, your ecosystem today, man? You, you're, you're, focused on taking a disability, making it an ability, or you're, you're focused on leadership and, and espousing the core tenets of leadership, at least from your yeah. perspective. Um, what does that look like? Yeah. So, you know, I've obviously built a business for myself as a speaker, you know, and, and doing that. And it's been amazing. And I realized that's fun, but it's not scalable, at least to the degree that I want it to be scalable, because in order to make the amount of money I want to make, I would have to travel 365 days a year. And I just don't want to do that. And so, you know, recently partnered up with a few people. One of them, you know, you know, is, is Brian Bogert. Oh, shout and, out to Brian Bogert, the man, the myth, the legend. What a lovely, lovely, yeah. spiritually connected man uh, that guy is. Yep. Yeah. And so the company that, you know, I've, I've started and everything will be live with the website and everything in the next couple of weeks is called Initiate Connections. And, and really what that company does is, Myself, Brian, you know, a handful of other people mainly focused on, um, on, on different types of workshops, speaking engagements, consulting at organizations, at schools, at conferences, things like that. And it's really focusing on my four main topics. And, and we might expand into other areas down the road. But the point of it is we're bringing on some really big names over the next couple of months of like professional athletes, CEOs, very big entrepreneurs, people like that. We want to keep it a very small Rolodex in the beginning of people that we think can deliver really insane value, but are big names to attract to companies. And it can go in a few ways. Like we will be running the workshops, the consulting speeches. However, a company could say, hey, we see you have this NFL player. We'd love to, you know, just bring them in for a one-time keynote. Okay, we can set that up and organize that. Or we do a workshop or consulting with the company. Maybe we do a two-day workshop where we go in and dive through these topics and, and work with them on it. 
but then maybe one of the keynotes is from this high profile uh, baseball player or one of these keynotes or work, small group workshops is from this really successful CEO. And then we run the rest of it. And so there's different areas to plug and play there. And eventually we'll get to the point where we can do this with enough people that I'll travel to some, but I don't need to travel all around the country because I'm getting paid during it when I'm not there because we have people trained on these topics on these areas and you know my life gets a lot easier. And you know that's really the main company. I have kind of my feet in, in another one as well that, that you kind of know of that Brian runs that I recently um, became a partner of, but that's, that's really my main one. Oh, that's beautiful, man. That, that I, you know, I, I can't help but think because of the way that social media has changed the world, at least in the last 10 years, the amount of opportunities it gives individuals to voice their perspective and opinions and bring positivity in the world. We always look at social media. We always look at those types of things as, you know, this kind of catalyst for negative behavior. But I think oftentimes there are so many good spirited professional athletes, entrepreneur, business people, yep. and bringing those folks together and lighting yep. the fire in other people and spreading the good and impacting others. Uh, it's something that I aspire uh, to do through this podcast and through the occasional times that I speak. Um, but at the level that you're doing it, at the level that these other folks are doing it, I'm excited to see how this, uh, would you say niche connections is the way? What uh, in initiate connections. Initiate connections. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that, that's rad, man. That's very cool. Thank you. Yeah. No, Where, where's the name coming from? Great. You know, one person who uh, we were connected with who is, is you know, involved in the company to a degree um, with helping us with get certain athletes and, and people that we want to work with. You know, he runs another company with a, a similar uh, name, essentially called Initiate Growth, which we really loved. And I was like, how can we, you know, because he's not a necessarily an owner in the business, but we're, you know, partnered with him in, in certain degrees and, you know, revenue shares and, and things like that. And we are like, love that, love the name Initiate. I think it's it's a great area. How can we make something similar to kind of add to this partnership, but, um, you know, tailor more towards what we're doing. And we came, or, yeah, we came from Initiate Connections and, and you know, we didn't want to be seen as like a speaker's bureau. We didn't want to be seen as like, it, it kind of just like a dime a dozen company. We wanted to look a little different. Um, not that there's anything wrong with, you know, speaker's bureaus and things like that. You know, I'm listed on some, it's great. It just wasn't for the, uh, business model we were looking to launch. Oh, sure. All right. So this is going to go back to, I mean, the full spectrum of your life here. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to know this because uh, folks like you, when I say folks like you, I mean, folks like me as well. I mean, folks like yeah. anybody who's in the space to spread positivity and love and just enjoys high performance from like a human perspective. How can we get the most out of our day? How can we live the lives that we want to live in a balanced, meaningful way? You had to have, at some point in time, mentors, either parental support, coaches, people that have entered your life. Maybe give a nod to some of those folks and maybe some of the lessons yeah. that you've learned along the way. You know, lots of people, people from growing up, like my mom and my dad were, were amazing, taking me to school every single day at 5 a.m. when I wanted to practice long snapping. Like that was insanely you know, generous of them you know, coaches that helped me along the way in high school and college, like I'd be nowhere without them. And then just, you know, today, different entrepreneurs that I've, you know, associated myself with people I've mentioned in the show, you know, Brian, Jeff, like people that I've learned a ton from and grown because of. Um, but, but I think it's about finding those right people. But the, the issue is that I see most people have, especially in like the business world, is they say, hey, I'm, I need to find a mentor. And they believe that like, they need to find someone who, can teach them, teach them everything and understand they go out and they look for a mentor. And that's really the wrong way to look about it. In my opinion, like I, I say all the time, every time I give a speech to a podcast, I mean, I'll, I'll say it like right now, my website is aaronglob.com. My email is aaronglob.com. If I can help you in any way, reach out. Most people will never reach out to me. The one person that does, I will help them however I can because very few people will actually do it. And when someone sees that you take the initiative, so I'll give, I'll give you Jeff as an example. You know, Jeff, I've, I've worked with, I actually, you know, at, at times have paid him to help me and, and teach me this stuff, but he's, you know, always loved working with me and I've loved learning with him from him. And, and the reason there is that he's enjoyed working with me so much is because like most of the people, you know, he, his main focus is building his businesses, but he runs some coaching on the side as well. And the reason, the, the issue with most people who, you know, go for coaching is they go in and they say, okay you know, how can we, you know, establish this problem? And they wait for that person to try and fix it for them. 
Whereas, you know, we go in and, and with Jeff, you know, we came up with that process of how can I get on all these TED Talks? And I come back to him the next week. I'm like, oh, solved it. I have like three books or like five meetings booked with different TED, you know, TEDx coordinators. You know, I have this whole list of, you know, 300 emails and I, I just did the work and I did it all by myself. And it was him helping guide me, but I was just taking the initiative and, and doing all of that. And I think that's the biggest thing is like turning yourself into someone who is worth being mentored instead of going out and looking for a mentor. Ooh, say that again. Turning yourself into someone who is worth being mentored instead of going out and looking for a mentor. Dude, I, I absolutely love that. That was my gold nugget. I was meant to hear today, man. I, I, I can relate to that so much where there's a pull relationship and I've had some coaching clients uh, that are like this, that I feel like I'm kind of I'm the only person advocating for them to take charge of their life. <laughs> that's, that's a weird, yeah. that's a weird position to be in. Yeah. It's, it's one that's needed sometimes when people are kind of catching their low lows or, or a little confused about things or, you know, whatever it is. But if that's your default operating system, you're going to have a hell of a time. You're not ever yeah. going to be able to implement some of the, the great and, advice that you might. Yeah. Be and honestly, like, I don't really like my language around what I said there. That was kind of the, the off the top of my head because, you know, I, I don't like saying that some people are worth and aren't worth being mentored because that's not true. It's, it's, that was, that was bad phrasing, but, and, and I'm trying to think of like the right way to it's say well, it. And I think you understand what I'm trying to say, but you know, it's, that wasn't the right phrasing no, necessarily. Well, no, no, I, I, I think it is like, I'm going to push back on this. I, I think it is. I don't think it is a, a value judgment in the fact that there are some people that are worth being mentored and some people that are not. But if you are being mentored, you need to show up as somebody yeah. <laughs> who has value to be mentored. You, you know what I mean? Like you need to show up to your half of the, the, the equation as well. You need to be present. You need to be ready to listen. You need to be ready to clear your calendar and implement. If you want to solve this problem, you, you better be able to take that, uh, that instruction or that distillation of, of the issue and go and run with it uh, in a yeah. meaningful way. So yeah, I, I think I get the core of what you're saying. I agree. There's probably some wordsmithing that we could do to it, but uh, at its core, I, that's, yeah. it, it's a powerful thought. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man. So what, what do you got going for the, actually, I, this is what I want to know. What do you do for fun, man? Like, what's your, what, what do you, what's your go-to? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I mean, obviously like I, I really love lifting weights. I love the gym. I, you know, I love sports and, and, you know, things like travel or, or going out to eat with my girlfriend. And, and you know, I, I love all of that. So that's, that's things I love for fun. But that's also not necessarily like besides lifting, it's not like a daily thing that I just go travel or, or go out to nice dinners and things like that. And it's corny to say, but like, I genuinely love business. Like I've, I've developed that enjoyment over the past several years of like, I love entrepreneurship. Like, how can I make an impact? How can I make more money? How can I build something really cool and exciting? Like it's, it's fun for me. I, I, I really enjoy it. Like I had a call uh, this morning with, with someone who um, was in like a Slack group that, I, that I'm in and, and, you know, she had messaged someone. I was like, Hey, like, if you want help, like happy to, you know, give you some advice. We hopped on a call for like 30 minutes and I was giving her some advice on her business. And I was just, I was so like, I love that. I, I was, yeah. I was like, this is like fun for me. And as I was speaking, I got ideas of like, you know, when I listen to my own advice, I come up with great ideas. And I was like, I have another idea for a business. I'm like, I have an idea of how to change outreach strategies of, of my business. Like, I'm just like, this helped me. Thank you. Yeah, dude. I, you know, it's funny. It is corny. A hundred percent to like, love, like, like nerdy business stuff. I, I love it too, though. Like I've, I've grown to, I've grown to really enjoy it. I do find myself in like my free time. Um, like today I've, I've got a handful of podcasts to do today. I'm going to a water park with my kids, but I still took a, I still took a meeting in the afternoon that I'm not getting paid for to go out to some polyphase farm out in Idaho and go see how they're running operations and you know, what they're passionate about and, it, you know, maybe help them out in some way, shape or form in the future. But it's not much of business development for me. It's, it's, it's just a great opportunity to go learn about yeah. a space that I don't know a ton about. And that fires me up because I'm going to come back and I'm going to contemplate it. Just like you're saying, and I'm going to think about it and I'm going to go, Oh yeah, I said this thing to them. And what if I just did that in this other yeah. area of my life that I'm completely ignoring? <laughs> yeah. But also like, and, and I don't know about if it's the same for you, but like I genuine and, and genuinely am like, probably will not start most of these in my lifetime, but I probably have like 15 business ideas, 20, 25 business ideas that like, 
I think are good ideas and would love to start. Now I can't do all of that. And maybe over the, t- over the years, I'll start some of them, but like, I love learning about new, interesting businesses and ideas because I mean, I, I literally could probably name 10 businesses right now that I think would be incredibly profitable, probably, you know, some simple, some really hard to start, but I just have an interest in, and if I had the time or, or ability to, I would start. Oh, dude. I've got three legal business entities with bank accounts and the whole deal that I haven't even done anything with. And I own about 15 or 20 domains that have <laughs> just good ideas. I have a good idea. And I'll just go out and I'll, I'll just start buying websites and it forces me to do something with it later. Um, but like, that's the other thing is like finding space for that in your life. And it used to really frustrate me. I used to feel, you know, like really, I guess, demotivated when I would start a project like that. But I've learned to build a shelf and to put things on it and to be patient with like where my focus is and where my goals really are today. And then eventually go back and then take something down off the shelf and then start playing with it. So, yeah. And and I mean, like for me, I've tried several businesses in the past and, you know, some have done okay. Some have failed, you know, you learn from your experiences and like, yes, I probably have 20 businesses that I think are good ideas and could start or could tell other people to start, but that being said, the only reason I'm really not focusing on that, I'm focusing on my business and kind of the minority stake that I have in that other one is because I want to build my business and initiate connections into an eight, nine figure business. And, and that yeah. is my goal. And down the road, yeah, I will start other businesses. But in the next 10 years, I want to initiate connections to be a hundred million dollar a year company. And, and that that is a goal with it. And I can't do that if I'm focusing on 15 other things. That's right, man. That's, that's right. You gotta, you gotta pick a horse sometimes and just pour into it and, uh, you know, take it where it's going to go. So you've got this business that you're building, you are still speaking and going around and doing stuff. What do you want the world to know, man? Like what, what is the overarching goal, like impact, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, yeah, obviously impact is, is definitely the number one. And I always say that it's, it's when I wake up every day, it's how can I you know, help and impact new people? Um, outside of that, I, I mean, I'm not lying. I want to build a hundred million dollar business. I want to make in a, a lot of money. Now that is not saying that to, you know, be greedy or anything. It's because I like business and I think it's fun and I want to find ways to, you know, continuously get better and beat myself every single day. Um, but that being said, making money is not my number one reason for you know, starting this business. It is, you know, definitely in the top three. But my number one reason is because I know that between me and the other people we'll be working with, we can make a lot of impact and help a lot of people. Very good, my man. Yeah, I am fired up about that. Well, you know, what uh, What else is going on that we should talk about? I mean, we've, we've touched on your background, your history. We've talked on some of the things that you do, some of the things that you speak on, kind of what you're up to today. What stone am I not turning over that's uh, relevant to discuss? <sighs> We've hit we've hit most things. I guess one thing that I, I you know haven't talked about necessarily on a ton of shows is the fact that over the past nine months, uh, ten or so months, in addition to you know everything I'm doing in business, and you know I left the world of finance to go full into you know all of this entrepreneurship, everything I'm doing, but and traveling to all these speaking events, I've been traveling back and forth to uh, between Boston, Massachusetts, and Los Angeles, California, basically like once a month. Um, you know, and splitting my time between here and LA for the past like 10 months. And I'm finally moving to LA at the end of the month. And so my life will get a lot simpler, but it's, uh, it's been a very hectic past nine or so months. Oh man. Why, why, uh, why LA? Is there just more, is there more opportunity for what you're doing there? Because so I, last I time I checked, there, most people are trying to move out of LA. I do think there will be a lot of opportunity for what I'm doing, but uh, my girlfriend's back in November, October timeframe moved there for some, for work. And, uh, you know, I just, with the flexibility of everything, not, you know, extremely busy, but I was able to make it work. And, you know, I've just been going back and forth and came to a position that, you know, a few months ago, I, I left the world of finance. And so I didn't have to be in Boston at all. And, and although I was doing finance and entrepreneurship, now it's, you know, no more finance, just entrepreneurship. Um, and, you know, left finance and I'm like, well, I love Boston. I have family here and I'll move back eventually, I'm sure. But I'm moving out to LA. So we don't have to do this whole back and forth thing anymore. Dude, I love Boston. I, I, I've, I've worked in both places. Um, I worked for two years in, in Southern California, uh, traveling almost every week down there. And then, uh, I spent a lot of time in Boston, uh, over a span of about five years. Um, man, they're, they're both great places in their own right. Um, what, what, uh, do you have kind of an area of LA kind of picked out? Yeah, I'll be in Santa Monica area. 
Oh yeah, that's perfect, man. Like Santa Monica. <laughs> yeah, great. right by the beach. Like right. they can't can't get much better than that out there. Yeah, you know, I I used to be in a beach volleyball league out there on like Tuesday nights and had nice. ha- had a great time. And then you get down, you start walking down toward the pier, and like there's just a, there's a lot of fun things to do uh, out in in that little pocket. I know things have changed a lot. I know Venice looks a lot different than it used to look, and um, you know, there's there's definitely a uh, a population of, of homeless individuals that are yeah. expanding out there. But I think at some point in time, hopefully um, LA can kind of get a grip on that, maybe provide those resources that are needed and start cleaning some of those areas up. But otherwise, man, it's a beautiful place to be. Yeah. hundred percent. All right, my man. Well, dude, cool. thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Um, this was exactly what I was hoping for. Just being able to speak to yeah. someone who's lived such a, a interesting, inspiring uh, existence, uh, doing something that's profound and awesome is putting the work in hard enough to go out and play division one football and then leveraging that perspective and expertise to pour into other people, inspire generations to come of individuals who are going to take a disability, make it an ability uh, and just get what they want out of life. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. That's exactly why I created this show is, is to talk to folks like yourself, man. So thank you so yeah. much for joining me today. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. All right. Cheers, brother.